Hello, it's Genji UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at a, well, you can't tell, you can't tell what it is. It's uh, a Neo Geo 6 slot. Look at the size of it, it's huge. Which, uh, yeah, it's to be expected because these are the biggest cars <laughs> on any sort of uh, uh, system, really. Let's just uh, rotate it around a little bit. It's interesting, it's been covered with like a uh, blue plastic. Um, so yeah, I don't uh, hold high hopes. What's that micro switch for there? That's interesting. I didn't know they had a micro switch on the board. Is that a model something someone's done? Anyway, yeah, I don't hold high hopes this is going to be a straightforward repair. There'll be a battery on here, and uh, the battery may have leaked and caused a massive amount of corrosion. First inspection, the slots actually look pretty good, actually. There's barely any uh, wear or anything there. They look, you know, totally straight. So I don't imagine it's had masses of use, you know, carts going in and out and stuff. Um, let's just have a look on the underside. So, yeah, it's looking a bit dirty, but I don't see any immediate damage there. So I'll start by removing all the screws around the edges and removing the feet. And we'll just separate the top from the bottom because I'd like to have a look at the battery area. So that's the metal cover off. Uh, you can see it's a bit dirty. Uh, we've got some damage here, a little mark. Uh, let's remove these screws here that uh, support. I've got one missing again over here, uh, but there is one over there, yeah, the, the board, and it should just lift off. So there we go, board separated, and you can see we have a battery. That has started to corrode, so I suspect if there's anything wrong with this, it's gonna be uh, that, I think. So a quick scan around the board, it would appear that this micro switch is to do with the feed to the battery, actually. It's enabling the battery. I think when this is connected there, then it's powered up when it's not when that's off, it's not. It's quite crazy, really. Uh, I can't imagine that that was stock. Maybe it was, maybe it was a stock thing. I've never seen that before. Uh, this is the version with the Pro chips, you know, Pro uh, B0, Pro C0, and the straight LSPC. You know, three large uh, quad flat packs there. So you don't have things like the C1 and the, D, uh, the, the D0 and other things like that, it's all sort of merged within those three, so this was the earlier chipset, which is strange, you know, it looks like they went straight for a four slot and a six slot, right on the uh, off, um, and then later came out with a two slot by the looks of things. You said 8 USM1, uh, YM2610, your Ram for your Z80, Pallet Rams I think, 68,000, uh, your main BIOS there, uh, SP1, and then you've got work RAM, backup RAM, and video RAM. Uh, and then you've got your uh, 2K uh, VRAMs up here. Still don't know what these are here either. Can you see uh, SC1, SC2? I will have uh, another look at some of the schematics, see if I can work out what those are. But I don't think there are any multi-slot uh, schematics available, actually. So, And I think those sockets from what I've seen are only on the multi-slots. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember seeing those on the standard uh, MVS board. Um, I guess I could trace where they are, where they're connected to, to work out perhaps what they're for. Uh, but yeah, we've got the uh, you know controller ports here, which is really nice, uh, and your headphone uh, and speaker adjustments here, and you know your connections and things here. Again, you probably have to ha hack away at the underside of one of these to connect it up to the headphone because I think those are inputs rather than outputs. Uh, dip switches. Let's just put all those dip switches up. I'm not sure why they're all down. Um, I'm tempted actually just to give this a try as it is actually. I could remove that, Let's see if I can... Yeah, I could just cut that off there. I'll cut the connections off. We'll try it without it and uh, just see what happens, I think. Yeah, I just cut that off. You can see the corrosion is pretty bad where the battery was there. And this IC down here is eating away a bit actually, this LS05. Um, so yeah, gonna need to do some work around there. Some of the traces here are a bit corroded. but. Uh, the area above it, yeah, I think one or two up here as well. We've got some corrosion there as well. So, yeah, we could have uh, an issue around here. That might be the fault with this board. So, as you can see, it's watchdogging. So, I think I'm just going to clean up around that battery area and just see if we can work out what's damaged around there. Inspect maybe further afield. Uh, and just see what's what. So I'm going to start by removing these uh, two ICs here, actually, uh, and then I'll focus perhaps on the uh, backup uh, RAM, you know, the HC32 over here, and uh, maybe the 2003 up there. Uh, 
Uh, and I'm just going to remove these with hot air. It's the easiest way. You know, preheat the underside. I'll preheat the underside of the board first, um, and then spend uh, you know two or three minutes on the top side here. Uh, and you, you can have you remove the chips like this many, many, many times this way. Just gently lever on one side, lever on the other. When it's reached temperature, it'll, it slides out super easy. As long as the pen, pins haven't been bent underneath, but you can inspect that before you start. You could try desoldering on the underside first. Sometimes I'll typically do that. Um, but with the solder as it is, you know, it's corroded. It won't uh, come off. So in order to get the couple of chips off, I need to use the desoldering station. I've just took the nozzle out. Can you see? It's just totally caked up. Look how full it is. It's long overdue uh, to be emptied and stuff and cleaned. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of prompted. Super annoying. That bit doesn't usually get blocked like that. I'm not quite sure what has blocked that. You can see the solder's molten there, but yet still, it's still caked up. There we go. Made a break through there. What happens is the flux will sort of... Uh, sticks on the inside and it just builds up this horrible thick brown mulch yeah that seems to be unblocked so what I'll do next uh, the way I normally do this is uh, I take a plate just because uh, it should be able to take the temperature here for this and I'll just carefully pull the glass out Let's just pull that back a bit Yeah, oop, gently on the plate like that. I have to leave that to cool for a minute or two, and then I can use some IPA to dislodge uh, all that. Yeah, so now that's cooled down a bit, what we can do is we can pull out uh, the filter here. There you go, it's done quite a good job because you can see that side's clean and that side's pretty much caked. And can you see that just with a gentle push it starts to come out because obviously uh, as long as you're not solely solid you know a solid lump of it in there uh, solder is uh, primarily uh, lead so it bends pretty easy you know it's quite malleable there we go get that I should plan for recycling <laughs> And in fact, you can do that. Some people collect large blobs of solar like that, and you put it in one of those little, uh, I forgot what it is, it's like a little ceramic thing that heats up, and you can melt that solder, uh, add some flux and stuff, skim the surface of it to get any impurities and stuff off it, and you can reuse it. But that'll probably go in the bin, in my case, I don't know. Post down below if you uh, recycle solder that way. So I've got some IPA on a rag. You can see this has been chipped previously. What I have to do is take a bit of that filter stuff and fluff it, you know, stick it into the edge there as I stick it in to, uh, you know, maintain the suction. I really should order a new one of these uh, glass pieces, but the last time I looked, they were about 15, 20 quid or something. Um, I should get one really while I can, but to be honest, I think I'm going to swap out this desolder station at some point and get something more modern. But can you see how much uh, cleaner that makes that? So to speak, and I could wash this in the sink, you know, leave it soaking. But it doesn't need to be super, super, super clean. I just want to try and get as much of the flux and dirt and bits of solder and stuff out of this before I uh, start to reuse it. So just for now, I'm going to reuse that filter just by pressing it down like that. You know, it's uh, mineral wool. And you can see I just have a bit hanging out here to uh, fill that void, actually. Yeah, it's on its very, very, very last legs, this. And if we just carefully uh, insert that in there like that and tighten it up, not too tight, because remember that glass is going to expand with you know thermal expansion as it warms up. So you don't want it too tight. There is a rubber ring there, so uh, yeah, that will help alleviate some of the pressure. But if you tighten it up too much, it will crack. But yeah, looking at the uh, thing there, can you see that show? Yeah, I've not got the nozzle in, but if I press it now, you can see that needle is not moving. If it was blocked, I'll show you. If I block the uh, airflow here, if I squeeze this, watch. So that shows I've got suction through there. No issues. You know, that part's now unblocked. 
sorry I can't get much closer than that but uh, yeah you can see just add a bit of solder get the uh, nozzle over the pin once it goes molten the pin will up oh, I was gonna say once it mol goes molten the pin will uh, wobble you know you can wobble it you can feel it move and you can see the so well you might not be able to see the solder has removed from there um, I don't think this is going to remove all the solder from both sides because the other side of this chip is really corroded. You know, the solder may not uh, be removed this way. Yeah, there you go. So most of the solder's free. That pin on the left, can you see? It's not quite free there. There's still a bit of solder, but the other ones, uh, yeah, they're looking pretty free. So I'll do the other side next. So most of the solder's off there, but to minimise the uh, risk of damage, I'm going to uh, use hot air, actually, to free it up. So I've preheated the underside at about 150 for a few minutes actually uh, and I'm just going to just heat this side now. I'm on a bit higher actually here, about 430 degrees actually. Uh, but these boards are super thick. Um, it will still take a good 3 or 4, maybe 5 minutes to get this off here I think this way. But I'd rather use a, a bit of more temperature like this and get it off this way without risking damage any pads. My SD card is doing my head in at the moment, actually every now and again it stops and says please use a faster SD card. It's brand new, it was working fine for the first few times I've used it, you know, filled it up, used it, filled it up, used it, you know, wiped it. And at each time it's been fine and about the third or fourth time it started saying use a faster SD card. So I re-socketed the 2003 there, cleaned up the legs and stuff, there was no damage around that. Uh, in fact there might have been one, there might be one drug damage trace, I can't remember. I don't think there was, I think that was okay. Um, so I've just cleaned up around here, I'm now going to use some, uh, you know, tinned uh, the solder braid here, you know, it's got a little bit of solder on it, to drag over these connections underneath the LS05 here. Now I've just mapped out, uh, you know, done some kind of continuity tests and mapped out, we've got a trace missing there actually on the LS05 from one of the vias you can just about see those little vias up here it's that little vias there it wants to go down to one of the pins sorry you just off shot there yeah the third uh, vias there that you can't hardly see uh, you can hardly see it when you're up close to the third pin down there so I'm going to clean up like I said the traces below it so that I can then get this socket on there uh, and then I'll finally just test around here. Before I do that I'm going to take some close-ups of these two um, chips here just so that I'm familiar with what the traces look like underneath because I do know that if you're not careful with these, even though everything measures okay, if you've got a problem with one particular vial where it, it seems alright but then when you power it up it blows, you know, it burns the trace out or something because it's, the connection was so weak you're then left wondering where everything goes and what where the connection's broken and where it should lead to or you know come from etc. So I could swap out these chips uh, and they may need to be swapped out depending on uh, you know uh, whether they work or not. I can test with the logic probe uh, in a minute but I'm just using a wire brush on the very edges here to get that green corrosion off uh, and then I'll go over with a fiberglass pen. Clean any solder off uh, the ends there you know off the tips with uh, some flux and solder braid just to make sure that when it goes in the socket it's not going to uh, pull the socket apart when you try and uh, remove the chip because you know there's little bits of solder on the edges. So we're missing the 244 at the moment but I don't think that that's going to be required to boot. We're still getting the same issue but I just want to show you something else. So feeling around the board here trying to see what's warm. Yeah that one's a little bit warm only very very lightly compared to everything else. Everything else is pretty cold and then I thought well let's focus on uh, 245s. Uh, there are some 245s here. That's warm. That's warm. That's not so bad actually, that's pretty cool there, another 245 there. Uh, some more 245s I think, uh, I'm not sure where the others are. But everything else is cool. These two 245s here are actually pretty warm. Warmer than anything else actually. So that would suggest to me maybe, and the data bus is, I don't know if I've shown you, the data bus, can you see? It goes high, 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 high on every single pin. Without a ROM in, you just get a single stuck high. You know, it doesn't flash, it doesn't pulse without a ROM. Um, 
and these two four fives here one side as you'll see is high impedance if i probe the pins there i don't you can see from that distance it's not doing anything because there's nothing plugged in you know this is where your memory card slots plug in i think uh, but on the other side as suspected you will see well, there you go data bus connection pulse 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 this is the data bus so um Whilst it might not be those that are actually faulty, they might be enabled at the wrong point in time or something, I'm going to remove them and we'll test it without just to see if we can get past the watchdog. So it's going dark here, you might not be able to see much. I've jumpered uh, J2 there, it's just two pads on the board and I've got a solder blob across there, just so that I can force it to skip the watchdog. Uh, and I'm focused on these two chips here. What I want to do is, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, these two chips here, two, four, fives. If we power up like that, it skips the watchdog. So we can switch it off and on. You see slightly different uh, visual uh, things each time, as you can see. But uh, there was a few things. One of them was the pallet. The pallets, you know, the calls seem a bit pale there. They're all of a certain kind of paleness, which made me start wondering about the pallet. Now, the two four fives you saw me remove uh, a few minutes ago down uh, in the area of CN6 and CN7 related to the uh, memory card. Two of those were definitely, I think, need replacement. But I think we've got another fault. I think there's something else. And I think, you know, I mentioned that uh, those two, the LS245s are getting warm next to the pallet there. If I just probe those, I'll show you. So I'll show you the ROM first. Can you see we've got highs? Highs all the way along, just stuck highs. So checking this uh, 245 here, you can see we've got pulsing on one side and stuck highs on the other and again uh, pulsing on that side stuck highs on the other now I mean it could well be that this is the data bus side the data bus is high anyway for some other reason but they are a little bit warm like those two over there were and everything else aside from the, uh, the um, LSPC is stone cold really they're the only chips that are getting warm uh, I think I need to rule them out just to make sure they're not interfering with the data bus so I'll uh, remove those next So just trying to follow the output enable, it leads to a via, I'll show you on the top side in a minute, but it goes here, and can you see this discord patch here? Uh, so you never know, we might have a broken trace or something there, uh, it's a bit of a coincidence, there's a big blob there um, on the uh, area where that via passes the uh, output enable. So I think this one's going to be the new most difficult repair I've uh, come across actually. Uh, I followed the output enable as I mentioned to that LS08 and I've uh, checked it and it's uh, the pin there. Yeah I'll just zoom you in a bit. So I traced the output enable to this pin here. The two pins next to it are the inputs. They're both high and that's an and so that's correct actually. You've got two highs you can have a high there. And the next thing I thought well okay let's just trace those two inputs and I suspected it was going to go to one of these pro chips over here and it does indeed go to the pro C0 and it comes up from two wires here so we've got connectivity to the two pins on the pro C0 I think you've got like a ROM enable low and a ROM enable high uh, SROM enable low, SROM enable high so this is responsible for controlling the output enable for the, the ROM there so this leaves me with a dilemma of is this chip the faults here it could be now it's not getting warm but it still could have failed on that particular gate there and the other thought with this there's going to be other factors so some of the connectivity to this here may be influenced in terms of that you know controlling that output enable signal depending on uh, what is uh, coming through on some of these connectors here from the top side I'm thinking I could be wrong because bear in mind this is going to toggle between the ROM 
and the uh, program ROM on the carts, I think, um, at various points in time. And there may well be something that's inhibiting it based on uh, signals from the board, from the top board. Uh, I'm not sure. So we could have a problem with something else, actually, some of the buffer chips and things. I'm not sure. Uh, it's possible. Although you would expect, because this has not got ROM in, you'd expect right from the offset, it would try and boot from the ROM. This is what I'm not sure about, you know, because there's so little information, unless you've got the experience of working, you know, the wisdom of working on one of these before. You don't really know what you're looking for. Um, I mean, I could just get my other four slot out because it's pretty much identical and uh, see whether, when there's no ROM in there, do we get an output enable. Um, I might do that because I don't really see what else I can do under the circumstances. The other thing I could do if it was there is swap the uh, C zeros around, but I'll be honest, I don't really want to risk damaging my four slot. I mean, I wouldn't damage it, but I just I don't want to to to, to do that really. If I'm honest, it would it be different if it was a, if I had a faulty four slot? I could take the C zero off that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure which way to go right now. So just on the off chance, I reflowed around the uh, chip there. It's not made any difference at all. The other thing, I, I was looking at this before, so my mind, my, sh my attention shifted back over to this, thinking maybe this has not got some prerequisite that it needs in order that it would be able to enable the uh, ROM output enable. So, you know, things I've talked about, like say, uh, reliance on the top board, maybe something else somewhere is wrong. But, uh, yeah, coming back to this, I probed this first. Um, when I was looking at the, the, the output enable around there, I was trying to find connectivity. I thought, well, let's just check this. It's nearby. It's uh, an XOR LS86. It's upside down there. Switch this on. The oddity here, pin one, you'll see. Uh, can you see that? It's floating, nothing. It's not indicating high or low. Pin two is a low. And bear in mind it's an XOR, it's exclusive OR, so only one of the inputs being high should result in a high. Pin three, we've got a high. So that is a bit strange actually. I don't understand we've got floating input on there, and I don't understand how we've ended up with a high. Would it give us a high if the, one of the inputs was floating? I don't know, maybe it would. Maybe it would. So if this went high, then that would go off. Maybe that's what they're doing. They're just not connected that first pin or something. I don't know. Uh, that's strange. So let's have a look at the next gate. So the next gate, we've, again, we've got nothing floating, a low, giving us a high. Same thing. So maybe they've used it in the same way. I don't know. Maybe they've got like an internal pull-up or something, but then would we not measure it here? That's what I'm having a hard time understanding. And then we've got ground, obviously. So, yeah, that's a bit strange, actually. And the other thing that struck me thinking about this, we haven't done a capture, so we don't know whether the ROM was enabled. The ROM may get enabled for a cycle or two, uh, and then not. Uh, I guess I could disable the, I could re-enable the watchdog, um, and then see whether we see pulsing, because in theory we should do as it resets. That might be a clue. In fact, I'll do that next. So this might be the first one I have to give up until I can get some spares. Uh, I'll just show you something. I've got the uh, output enable pin on the ROM just flying out the socket actually. And if I just ground it, just watch. Um, see at the bottom, hold start to select the uh, soft reset. Yeah, you might not be able to see that. It's in very dark sort of red text. Uh, now we're going to have a pallet problem because obviously if the ROM's enabled constantly for a period of time there, it can't perhaps uh, read from the uh, palette or write the palette, rather. But the interesting thing is, we, you know, we've had that sort of weird, sort of red and beige thing going on. Yeah, you see, like, I don't know, because it's not booting. You see, it can't write the palette anyway. So you're going to get that. You're going to get those weird colours like that. You know, those pastel sort of colours. If you see what I'm saying when it can't boot. I just find it interesting that we can actually get some text up there. That kind of indicates to me that maybe the LSPC, it says W round on writable, yeah well that's that's a given because at the point where I enabled the ROM, the ROM would be uh, causing a bus conflict, you know, the data bus would be in use by the ROM, you know, the ROM would be an output enabled state. 
So you can't go off that error as uh, of WRAM uh, unwritable. I don't think. I don't think that would cause a problem anyway if there was a problem with WRAM. Unless it was outputting what it shouldn't be doing, but I've probed the uh, pins there. I mean, I could uh, check that. Now. Yeah, the output enable for the RAM is just high. Um, and it's the same with the backup RAM as well. So it's like it's not like the RAM is causing a problem here. It's as if there's a problem with the, the C Pro Z0 actually. I think it's, it's just not enabling the ROM what it should be doing, I think. Although I've just made an interesting discovery actually. If I probe, this is the output enable pin, so you can see that, pulsing high, 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 high with each watchdog. If I now enable the ROM with that wire, just watch, did you see it go low? It went high then low? Now bear in mind, this is the socket, the chip is isolated from the edge, so what you wouldn't see in here, you're not seeing me grounding it, what you're seeing is the system responding as part of the normal boots and enabling the ROM there, which I find super interesting, actually. How would that happen? Um, I don't know. That makes me wonder, uh, I don't know, I can't think, I can't think what would cause that. If, because if the ROM was not enabled, the CPU's got no reset vector. This is what I don't understand. What I'm trying to understand is at what point does the output enable go low? We are seeing here that when it can read the ROM, at some point there, the output enable does go low. How would that happen? How would that happen? Because if it was just happening with a watchdog, when it's watchdogging now, we would expect to see that happening now. This is what I'm having a hard time understanding. We know the CPU's probably not the fault. Well, it's running code because when we force the ROM enabled, we get the text coming up, you know, the, the diagnostics menu there, it says the WRAM's a problem, it says hold start, slash select, blah, blah, blah. So we've learned a few things by doing that, but I'm just not really sure where that leaves me. It leaves me in a position trying to understand what else could inhibit the output enable because that seems to be what it is if i force the output enable yeah we get it starting and it then toggles here which suggests that the pro c0 can drive the output enable low it's not like the uh, the gate has failed on the output something could have failed in the logic internally that means it's not doing it in under every situation correctly maybe it's inverted maybe that's what's going on Maybe when it's um, trying to enable the RAM, the output enable for the ROM's coming on, or something like that. I don't know. I mean, I could try inverting it to see if... Uh, would that solve it? I don't know. It might do if, that was, if there's some crazy thing going on there where it suddenly started inverting when it shouldn't be doing. I don't know how that would happen. Maybe there's a, a reason for that in the way it might fail internally. I don't know, but it's strange nonetheless. So whilst the HC32 looks okay, you know, the pins were a bit green, uh, I don't know, you can see that, yeah, a little bit. So I thought, let's just swap it out anyway. I don't see how it could be causing a problem, unless at some point it's trying to enable the RAM at the same time as the ROM or something like that when it's first booting. And yeah, I can't detect it because I'm not using a logic uh, analyzer to capture. Um, that pin there has been an absolute to, to desolder. Uh, and if you get that, obviously, you know, the normal technique is, you know, I've used hot air, um, heated it 450 degrees for I don't know, five minutes you know, on both sides. Then tried to desolder it, no chance, not coming out, not unblocking. Tried the desolder station and the soldering iron at the same time from alternative sides, from the same side. Doesn't matter, desolder braid, flux, nothing. That will not unblock. And it's because the ground, the, the, the rail on the other side is the ground, isn't it? It's, it's like that thick and it goes the whole length of the board. It's absolutely crazy. You may as well stuck a heat sink on there as well whilst they're at it. Uh, there's no way with the uh, soldering irons I've got here. I mean, if I had like a 60 watt iron 
or something. In fact, I've got one somewhere. That would do the trick. But uh, you know what? I'm getting bored with it. I'm just going to drill the blooming thing out. So I've got a drill bit here that I'll just test it to make sure it's the same size as the other holes. Hang on. Yeah, it's exactly the right size. I'm just going to drill it out. Solder is just lead, so it should be super easy to drill through. Um, I'll to make sure it's nice and centralised and stuff. I've removed as much of the solder off the top there, so I've got a nice pilot. Uh, and I'm just going to drill it out. It's far easier. As long as you're careful with the drill, you don't use a drill that's too large, uh, then there's no reason why not, why this is not uh, a good way of unblocking an unblockable hole like that. There we go, all drilled out. Thank goodness for that. That was a nightmare. Uh, it did even take uh, another 10 minutes actually trying to drill that out. Actually, I had to increase from the smaller size drill bit to a slightly larger one. That was the exact. Uh oh, yes, oh, yes. If I could do a victory dance, if I was uh, not embarrassed, uh, which I would be, uh, I'd be doing a, a Theresa May victory dance now. It's working, and uh, I'll show you what the problem was. You can just about see that. Can you see the top uh, pallets uh, dead? So yeah, that's to be expected. We've got loads of the 74245s dead. It's interesting, it actually says that on there, pallet 74245 dead output. So uh, fantastic and well chuffed. So there's still a lot to do on this board at the moment. The state it's in, you know, you can see up here I've not finished cleaning up. One or two of these chips need to come off still. This 05 here was the final piece of the puzzle, actually. A connection was broken. Um, it looked okay, and I'm sure I measured it previously and it was okay, but that was the fault. I had a broken trace there. Um, so there's a number of things. I burnt out a trace. Uh, I didn't capture it, otherwise it would have been entertaining, I guess, for you to see. I burnt out a trace by trying to probe with a logic probe here. You've got VCC and the pin next to it. And it just so happens the first two pins there on this first gate on here, well, it's the last gate, actually, if you think about it from pin 1B down, uh, down here, those uh, two inputs are tied to ground. So me coming in at an angle from the VCC pin to these pins here. Uh, is it those pins? Yeah, that pin there. I'm just looking, that one's a high. I could have sworn they were both. I might have it around the wrong way. Yeah, I think one of them is tied to ground. Uh, let's just have a look at the pin out there. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused by that, actually. Yeah, I managed to confuse myself there for a minute. You'll see we've got VCC there, ground, pulsed. Um, I, was, I could have sworn that those t two pins there were uh, connected to ground, but they're not. Uh, I've got a mistake on my diagram, I need to update that actually. Uh, yeah, but the second pin is tied to ground, you know, so you've got VCC, ground, and I shorted across, poof, the power went off, you know, and I could smell uh, an awful smell. I was like, oh my god, what have I burnt out? Now, the thing is, when I was probing this, this is related to A22 and A23 that connect to the Pro C0 actually so I was worried thinking oh have I destroyed the Pro C0 you know uh, or have I destroyed the CPU um, and it was just the trace had burnt out underneath and then I realized yeah it was because I just shorted out the supply so that's all it was I'll show you that later but I need to do a lot to this board it's going to be uh, covered in the second video I think the main purpose of this video is just try and get some life which we've got here um, I might just try and reinstate some of the chips um, see if we can test a car or something within this video um, and then we'll report back on the next video, uh, you know, the final sort of state of play. So as we covered earlier on, the output enable for the ROM was my clue. That was what, you know, that was what I hooked on to, latched onto, and was like, well, why have we not got an output enable? Surely we should have a low there. Um, and there were a few things that came out of that. One of them was this. Now, um, I blew, uh, you know, I burnt that trace out as I was measuring around there, and I was trying to follow A22 and A23. At that point in time, uh, I shifted my focus, so I was trying to follow the output enable. I followed it through the vias as I explained, all the way across the board here to an LS08 here, and the input to the, there's two inputs to this 08. I traced all the way back over to the Pro uh, C0, and at that point, you know, you, I think I covered this earlier in the video. I was convinced maybe there was either something wrong with this or some other prerequisite that meant that um, this was not outputting the you know output enable signals <coughs> correctly because there's two of them. There's, and they come out on this side, actually the top of the chip here. There's the upper one and a lower one, uh, and they both form the and condition here 
for this, you know, that gives you your output select, you know, the output of this drives you, your output enable on your ROM. Uh, so at that point in time, I posted on Twitter and I messaged Furtech as well. Furtech came back and uh, I'll stick uh, a screenshot up with uh, the exact text there so you can see um, how, how it actually works. But from what I could understand, he was saying that a tw there's four, four address bits in use. So in layman's terms, there's some address decoding going on, where it tries to fool the system into thinking it's looking at a different, uh, you know, uh, address than the, the address that it's actually looking. And uh, it seems to be that first um, is it zero to FF um, address range there, where it's, I presume it's looking to some sort of vector table or something. Maybe the vectors for all the different, uh, I don't know, interrupts. And I, I honestly don't know. It's not something I've really looked at with the 68K before. Um, it's the equivalent of the reset vector, I think. So, um, what was going on is we had in this XOR chip here, um, those A22 and A23 go through each, well, there's three lots of gates used on there, and they go through pretty, uh, all three of them, actually. Uh, and a few of those signals land up on the uh, Pro C0 it, 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 via the A22i and A23i pins there. But the there are another, there's another output that goes over to the LSO5 over there, um, and there's a connection to this LSO5 as well. So I'm guessing that and the 259 up here, I don't know whether that's related, but there's another 259 on the other side. And I'm just wondering if there's some relationship there to uh, something to do with the, um, the that address decoding. I think, because I haven't seen a relationship yet between A19 and A20, or is it A20 and A21? Yeah, A20 and 21, um, and those need to be uh, in a zero state, you know, a low state, uh, in order to get that uh, initial, uh, you know, okay, you're trying to boot, let's, uh, you know, assert the ROM, let's put the ROM in the, uh, you know, and output enable low on the ROM so that you can uh, boot. So, yeah, that was why it wasn't booting, um, but it was invaluable doing the test I did earlier, which is to lift the output enable pin here and just temporarily ground it to prove that the system was functioning. I would suggest that you do a similar thing. You get a, system, a problem with one of these boards, you can do that, and you, you, you very quickly determine the, the state of the backbone of the system besides that initial boot problem. But it's interesting, the uh, corrosion around here, around the backup area, you know, with the battery there, uh, can cause one of these to not boot that way. It was not what I expected. I thought there was going to be something uh, more complex with this. So I think what I'll do next, we'll get the uh, Pallet Ram 245s back on there. Uh, we'll socket, obviously, we'll stick sockets on there. And now I'm assuming they're okay, but they were the only things... That, what I did is I tried to focus on these 245s that were getting warm. Because right at the start, once I'd fixed the corrosion damage... Well, I thought I'd fixed all the corrosion damage around here. I was convinced that the reason it wasn't booting is that something was interfering with the data bus. Had I got a, you know, a, well, if I had one, a professional logic analyzer, I could have scoped the whole data bus and the address bus and had a look and gone, okay, yeah, it's not the data bus. I mean, in theory, I could have scoped the data bus and that would have been enough perhaps to go, well, actually, I'm seeing things other than just FFs, etc. But I'm not that familiar with 60, uh, you know, 68,000 assembly. It would, it would have been a nightmare for me. You know, it took me a long time. So it was no real problem removing some of these things. And I'll socket them all up so we've got sockets there anyway. These down here, I suspect I might be able to boot without. I think they're going to be for the uh, memory card uh, readers here. Or slot, you know, sockets for the reader boards. Um, the 244 here, I suspect, will be required. Maybe it's for passing the address lines out through here for, to the top board or something like that. So, yeah, I'll socket that up. I need to check if there's any damage there that needs patching up. Um, and we'll just see what's going on with the top board quickly. 
So in the next video I'll uh, spend a bit more time focusing around some of the cleanup work here or perhaps show you removing one of the chips down here um, and uh, just some of the techniques but I mean you know in general I've shown a lot of these techniques throughout my videos before anyway there's nothing rocket science about it. So you can see a lot of the traces look silver there um, there's just one that goes through the middle of these uh, connections here that hasn't really been tinned properly and I just want to just go up and down over it like this with some desolder braid that's tinned just to uh, cover that exposed trace it's not covering very well actually just near that via there yeah I'll inspect that and just repeat but uh, let me see if I can get you close up yeah so you can see what I'm trying to achieve here uh, sorry the flux is uh, super shiny uh, yeah, there's a bit here that's not quite covered, and there's a bit here. Um, I just need to inspect. I've measured the trace; it's okay. You know, the flux is making it look a mess there. But if I show you up around here, you know, some of these, I'll take that cap off and clean up around there. There's loads of corrosion around there that need cleaning up. You can see where I've, you know, um, tinned the traces here. Uh, this lot here all needs to come off. It's been cleaned up, but yeah, you'd really need to take these off and either replace or certainly clean them up. Um, the connections there are all okay, you know. And with each one of these here that's been socketed, I've done the same thing. I've cleaned up any vias, cleaned, cleaned up the traces. By the time we get up to about this position here, it's not too bad. It's just cosmetic. Um, and you can see, you know, the legs have cleaned them up with the wire brush and fiberglass pen. They've come up pretty good, actually. Um, the 05 uh, perhaps just needs swapping out. Uh, it couldn't be cleaned up further, can you see? It's still a bit green on the top there. I could soak that in some vinegar actually and then get the wire brush onto it, then they get the fiberglass pen, maybe even coat them in solder to recover them. But yeah, they're a little bit green still. But you know, it's interesting the chips still work. The two, uh, the 7432 over here, HC32, I've got a replacement. I can put the original one back in actually. That was just to rule it out at that point in time, but I think the original one's fine as well. But primarily, it's, it's just the area around here. You can see there's three traces. This is just a fudge for the moment. What I will do in the next video is relocate. I'll trace these to the end, you know, the end points underneath and have uh, wire links from via to via rather than across the little traces here looking a mess. Uh, it's just to get it up and running. So I'll get sockets on this area here while I'm on this video, but I don't think those are going to be needed for the moment. I'll leave them unplugged. Uh, it's just these two. This is why it's squawking about the pallets. Uh, but you can see, uh, you know, and again, this, these are techniques, the useful techniques that you can divide and conquer again. If you remove things like this, if you think you've got a problem with your data bus, you know, these two four fives, these will interfere. So, uh, you know, having removed them um, is, uh, you know, a good way of doing it. That two four four there is uh, not relevant, I don't think. The reason that came off is this corrosion. You know, it's just above that 05 there. Um, as soon as we get down here, things start to look okay. Um, the board's a bit dirty. But yeah, there's no, the corrosion's not really gone further afield. So if you look how corroded that chip is there, can you see all the green on it uh, on both sides? But can you see the difference there? It's looking a bit grey up here still, but all that green has gone off there. So pallet 245 is reinstated, uh, 244 reinstated, and let's switch it on. Oh yes, all tests passed, fantastic, that's what we want to see. So uh, I'm going to stick the top board on now, and um, we'll just uh, quickly test the um, slots I think. Um, I'm tempted to do the sound test, but to be honest, these four and six slot, and even two slots, the sound side is very reliable compared to a lot of the single slots. So, I, you know, other than if you've got problems with the uh, uh, multiplex and demux and stuff, you know, the actual thing that's select, the logic there to select which slot is used, those, that fails. But in terms of the actual sound hardware here, doesn't tend to fail. So I've still got the diagnostics uh, roaming actually, I forgot. I've got the top board on with the Bang Bang Busters car in there. Just because I've got an M1 diagnostics on that Bang Bang Busters car. Don't make the mistake from watching some of my videos thinking that you need a bang bang, copy of Bang Bang Busters to go with the diagnostics side of things. You don't. Any cart, so you can swap out the M1 ROM chip on that cart. Or in my case I've got a switchable one so I can use the 
the M1 that belongs to the game, you know, so the game works as normal, I can switch it over and then it behaves as a diagnostics M1. Anyway, that cart is in slot one. The first slot is the slot that will be uh, used. And if we hold down uh, D and do select start, is it D? Let's just do that again. I can't remember what the sound test is. It says hold down D and soft reset with the cart insert. Yeah, so maybe it's not detecting slot one because we're getting a stuck screen there. So there could be something wrong with the sound side of things on this yet. Anyway, let's just uh, forget that for now. Let's just hold down A, B, C, D, do select and start. Uh, and let's just go through the other tests. You saw the calendar test a minute ago, that worked. So the color bars, that works okay. Controller test, we'll just test player one, left, right, up, down, A, B, C, D, all together. Select, start. So yeah, that's working okay. Uh, w ramp, backup ramp. Yep, that's cycling round. Stop that. Hang on, gotta hold down A B C D again. I've got Z80 over there. Uh, pallet ram. Yep, that's working okay. V ram. Yep, that's working okay. Yeah, so everything's all right there, apart from uh, the Z80 by the looks of things. Yeah, if you hold down D to go into the, you know, to hold to do the Z80 test, it's not working. Could be a dirty slot. I'll experiment. Yeah, so we'll take the ROM out and we'll swap it over for the Unibars. Um, you can, if you press a certain direction when it's booting, specify which slot you want it to look through to pick up the M1 diagnostics uh, there. But I'm, I don't know what that is. I, I'd need to go away and have a look on the wiki. Uh, but I'm guessing maybe one of the slots is dirty. Maybe the slot, the slot one is dirty or it's not working. So now we've got Unibars. Let's test it with the game and see what happens. Yeah, we're just getting a crosshatch. That's slot six. I've gone through all four, all six slots already. Let's see four slots then. Uh, slot five. Let's try that. Yeah, it's just not. Uh, it's not doing anything at all. Uh, let's try slot four. Now this could be because we're missing those two four fives actually. I'm thinking that they were used by the, uh, or primarily used by the uh, expand, you know, the memory card slots there. Uh, but now I think about it, I'm thinking maybe one, you know, two of them are used for something else actually. Because yeah, that would make sense. You wouldn't want all four to be utilised there. So I think in order to get the uh, slots working. We need to get a couple more of those 245s on there. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Let's uh, sock it up those other 245s. So just the same with the uh, 74 AS 245s fitted there. The HCT one's pretty sure it is the uh, memory card slots there, you know, CN7 and CN6, because the traces go straight to them, actually. But there is no more mystery. This is the underside of the top board, and you can you see the corrosion here? So this is why it's not able to boot, actually. We'll look at this in the next video. Something's leaked onto the board here as well on this side. But the side we were looking at underneath where you saw that corrosion a minute ago is under this area here, actually. This is where the battery would have sat on the you know, other board, just underneath. So the board's obviously, you know, the corrosion's either got, you know, vapour has gone upwards or the board has been sat upside down for a period of time so the corrosion's leaked off onto the underside of this board. It could be worse though, I've seen them a lot worse than that. But the main thing is, at least it's up and running now. Anyway, I do hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.